Hello, everyone, and welcome to another book club meeting. Today, we are going to be engaging with the dead body of St. Hugh of Lincoln through two pieces of literature. It's a real two-for-one book club this time. Of course, I began my literary journey with The Incorruptibles by Joan Carol Cruz, where I was reading about St. Hugh of Lincoln, who lived from 1140 to 1200 AD. So as I was reading about his life, I realized that I think he's pretty boring. Like there is this quote from an eight-year-old Hugh, where he says, I needed no persuasion to renounce pleasure, of which I knew nothing. And it's like that where we're starting in the childhood. But then he dies. And it seems to me that things get a little bit more interesting. And the author of this book, she includes this footnote where she's talking about this amazing, miraculous occurrence. And here it is, footnote number two. There's this book written by Herbert Thurston called The Life of St. Hugh of Lincoln, which includes eyewitness medieval accounts of the funeral and the after effects of this dead body. Hmm. And I tracked down that book and I printed off the two interesting chapters. And really, that is the bulk of Book Club today. Okay, here we go. As soon as the Holy Bishop of Lincoln, St. Hugh, had breathed his last, the chaplain recited the usual prayers over his body and then prepared to wash the remains of his beloved master as he had previously been commanded. Oh. There was indeed no need for this charitable office, for despite the fact that the saint had refused any such service during his sickness, meaning he didn't want to be washed, the body was found perfectly white, pure, and clean. In deep admiration at this wonderful sight, the chaplain nevertheless faithfully accomplished all that he had promised. Which I think is a dramatic way of saying, miraculously, the body did not need to be washed, but the chaplain washed it anyway. So this is miracle number one. There's going to be several. So that's a good start. If I was that chaplain, I would have taken that as a pass. Then we jump ahead to Saturday, November 18th. That is when they have a triumphal procession for the dead body of St. Hugh. The clergy and a number of people from London carried wax candles and were preceded by a crossbearer accompanying the coffin for a considerable distance beyond the city walls. So St. Hugh's body is being taken to his ultimate burial spot, and it's quite a procession along the way. During the funeral procession, the exceedingly bad weather which prevailed was no hindrance to these expressions of devotion and the popular enthusiasm was soon further stimulated by the report of miracles said to have taken place while the procession was on its way. So all the peasants like us were starting to hear about these miracles happening, and they're like, we're not even worried about this weather. Let's see what's going to happen next. Four serving men on horseback carried lighted candles on each side of the bier, B-I-E-R, which is like the platform on which a corpse would be carried. I'm sure he was in a coffin. It was soon perceived that nothing could extinguish the candles that these men were carrying. Neither the violence of the wind, nor the abundance of the rain that fell continually, nor the hasty movements of those who held them. The numerous spectators of this marvel burst forth into expressions of astonishment. Many of them tried themselves to keep a candle alight under these circumstances and could not succeed even by protecting it with two hands. So that was Saturday. Now we're jumping ahead to Tuesday, November 21st, where the procession entered Stamford. In the midst of the general emotion, one man made himself especially conspicuous for the intensity of his devotion to St. Hugh. This was a poor shoemaker who, although he was obliged to gain his own living and support his family by the sweat of his brow, he had never neglected the care of his soul and edified the whole town by the holiness of his life and his zeal in all good works. I do feel like he and I would not have gotten along. Being prevented from approaching the coffin by the dense crowd that surrounded it, this cobbler knelt down and was heard by many to pray aloud in the following words. He said, in quote, O God of mercy, why wilt thou not permit me to approach the body of thy faithful servant, St. Hugh? Suffer me to draw near to the sacred beer, just learn that word, and then call my soul to thyself far away from this world and its miseries. And the people, moved by his faith and devotion, 
those who stood near the poor man made room for him to pass between them, so that at last he succeeded in getting close to the coffin when he knelt down and venerated it. So his tactic worked, the plot twist. After this touching scene, the coffin was taken into the church where it was to remain till the morning, and the poor man retired to his house which was close at hand on the other side of the road. I like that detail. But only a very short time afterwards, his neighbors came rushing into the church, calling out for a priest. <gasps> the cobbler's prayers had been answered, and he had been attacked by a sudden and fatal illness. Because remember, he said, Suffer me to draw near the sacred beer, and then call my soul to thyself. So he's like, I would uh, die to touch this dead body. And God said, note taken. He had just time to make his confession, and almost immediately after the Blessed Sacrament had been brought to him, he breathed his last sigh in peace. I haven't really heard of a miracle like this where someone prayed to die and they died. All right, now it's Wednesday, November 22nd in Ancaster. The body is on display in a new church this time. After the holy body had been exposed some little time for the veneration of the faithful, it was taken into an adjoining hall and reclothed in all the Episcopal ornaments which the saint had worn on the day of his consecration. The good chaplain left his testimony of what he witnessed in these words. Truly the sight we then beheld was nothing short of a miracle. The flesh, as we uncovered it, shone like snow. And though so many days had now elapsed since death, it had about it a glory as if it were a risen body. There was nothing livid or discolored or corpse-like about the holy remains. The arms, the hands, and the fingers were as supple and flexible as those of a person in life. And this is where we're talking incorruptible, right? This is why he's in the book. And then we have another first-person account of what's happening in the moment at this church. During this time, as we sat a little distance conversing with the venerable dean of the cathedral, there came to us some persons in wonderment and excitement saying, quote, have you seen how beautiful the face of St. Hugh has become? It has taken the color of the loveliest rose. Don't I love this? The dean listened stupefied, but I interrupted the speakers and said, you make a mistake, dear brothers. I said, the face of our St. Hugh is indeed marvelously radiant and comely, but there are no roses upon his cheeks. Only a few moments ago, we were admiring their fairness. So our friend here is like, you can say all you want about him being fair, but don't be saying he's got rosiness on his cheeks because that's not true. That's a bridge too far. But they led us back to the holy body and there we were all witnesses of the change that had taken place. The lovely rose color was truly there, and it remained on our bishop's face until he was laid in the tomb. So our little witness must have been a little embarrassed. And then there's mention of two more miracles which happen. There's this thief which steals a woman's purse at the tomb. So he like clips it off of her belt while she's praying. And then he tries to leave the church and God strikes him blind. And he's like, really worried because he's gone blind and everyone's like what's going on and he's like i'm a thief i stole this bag and now i'm blind and then he's like i'll return it and then he regains his eyesight and there's a knight whose arm was decaying and it's healed which is wonderful and then there's this other woman who was blind and her sight was regained through her engaging with saint hugh's body but they say these men they said, oh, we should ring the bells to celebrate this woman's miracle of regaining her sight. But it goes on to say, but we refused to do this because the woman was unknown to us and we could not be sure of the truth of her story. It's like, okay, so you know this thief who just regained his eyesight? He's been blind for like two minutes but he gets to make it in the book with no challenge to his reputation. This woman has been blind for years. And it's like, oh, we don't know her. Whatever, and like, what, you know the knight? Okay, he's a brother-in-law. I'm just saying, we're gonna believe all these miracles? Believe her. Okay, now we are on Friday, November 24th. After another solemn requiem, the body of St. Hugh was finally deposited in his tomb. Finally is correct. This was made the occasion of supreme demonstration of piety and affection. Everyone in the cathedral pressed forward to take a last look at the calm and beautiful face, those rosy cheeks, which was now to be hidden from their gaze. 
As he was being borne from the choir to the chapel, the procession was more than once forced back by the surging crowd, who tried to secure some little fragment of the vestments or the ornaments which had been in contact with his body. Every one of these would be preserved as a sacred relic. So these are our people. They're like ripping off pieces of his clothing. They're touching stuff to the body, getting that second class relic energy. And that's the hustle. Okay, so chapter 10 is about the translation of the relics of St. Hugh. So this is happening on the 6th of October in 1280. So it's been 80 years since he was buried, which is what we just read. And now his body is about to be moved to a better burial location. So that's just the context. And then this is the moment which I originally read about in The Incorruptibles. It's like, this has to be in book club. All those present had previously prepared themselves by prayer and fasting for participating in this work of piety, the moving of the body. Then when the time came, which it seemed most fitting for the purpose, this was at night after the office of Manton. The prelates and the clergy approached the marble tomb where the body of St. Hugh lay, and although it had been deposited there for well nigh 80 years, it was found incorrupt and almost unchanged. Okay, but here's the moment. As soon as the archbishop laid his hand on the glorious head of St. Hugh, it separated from the shoulders, leaving the neck fresh and red, just as if death had been recent. Which, okay, like, that's a surprise, right? If the body looks fresh, you touch it, and the head falls off, that would seem like it's a little bit corrupt right? But they try and cover it up, being like, no, no, no. It's not like he's a skeleton whose head fell off, because the neck is still fresh and red, as if he'd just been beheaded. But he wasn't. Someone just, like, touched him, and it... But then it gets better. I love this logic. Many of those present considered this separation to be miraculous because the magnificent reliquary which had been prepared to receive the sacred remains of St. Hugh was not long enough to have contained both the head and body together. So the miracle is whoever was commissioned to make the new coffin for the new burial spot made it too short so that when the bishop touched the body, the head fell off and now it would fit into the new coffin. That is a very specific miracle as they always are. So many questions, of course. I relate to the person who was commissioned to build the new coffin because they did it wrong and I've messed up a lot of things. They build it too short. They're sweating bullets because they're seeing like, this is not going to fit in this. Bishop touches the body, head falls off. They're like, we went from me being fired to God intervening on my behalf and saving my job. So head is separate, and it continues. Afterwards, singing hymns and canticles, the clergy carried the remains of St. Hugh into the vestry of the cathedral. There the venerable head, separate, also was carefully washed and dried, and both were left in safekeeping until the morning. And then it gets good. On the following morning, the same bishops and canons returned to the place where the holy body had been left and prepared to conclude the solemn office of the translation. In the course of the ceremony, it happened that the Bishop of Lincoln took up the head of St. Hugh and held it for a while reverently before him. Just so happened, picked up the head. Casual. As he did this, there was an abundance of the same pure oil which flowed from the jaw over the bishop's hands. And this notwithstanding that the venerable head had been carefully washed a few hours before. So he's holding it. Oil is flowing out of this decapitated head. The oil only ceased to flow when the bishop had placed his precious burden on a silver dish upon which the relic was to be carried through the crowd. So that's like the off button, apparently. And if you ever have to engage with one of my body parts after I'm dead, I would like for them to only be referred to as a precious burden. And then the procession made its way through the church to the place where the shrine was richly adorned with gold, silver, and precious stones. It is in this holy spot that both the head and the body are venerated. Which it is nice that they kept them close to each other. In some instances, I could see them shipping off that head to a different church so they could get some pilgrims, you know, because that would be a big draw. Amazing. Well, thank you for joining me. I know that was a little different, but I'm like, this information needs to be archived 
for my own sake, and I hope you enjoy learning about it with me. This book club has been quite educational so far, if I do say so myself. We will be back soon with another book on a very different topic, I'm sure, and I will talk to all of you then.